Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be taking a look at the SIR model, a commonly used method for modelling the spread of infectious diseases. And in its most basic form, the SIR model splits the population into three categories. You're either susceptible, so you could catch the disease, or you're infected, or you're in the last group, which we call recovered or removed. And that means you're either immune to the disease now, or you might be dead. Either way, you can't catch the disease again, which is all we care about for now. So we've got our three groups. Now we need some equations to describe how people can move between these different states. And let's start with the susceptible group. Now you can only move out of this group by getting infected. And because infections happen when a susceptible person and an infected one meet, we're going to assume that ds by dt is proportional to both s and i. Something like this, where beta is a constant and n is the size of our population. Next, let's consider the number of infected. Well, this needs to include the susceptible people getting infected, and also people recovering from the disease and moving into the removed category. And very simply, we'll assume that the number of people recovering is just a constant gamma times the current number of infected. Then finally, we can write down our equation for dr by dt, which we know has to equal gamma i, so that we have ds by dt plus di by dt plus dr by dt equals zero. So our population is always n. Now, I mentioned that this is the most basic form of this model, and we'll take a look at more complex things later on. But let's think about the assumptions we've made so far. Well, firstly, our immunity lasts forever. So once you've recovered, you stay there forever, which might not be very realistic. Also, there aren't any births or deaths in our population, and that might be an appropriate simplification to make if we're only looking at a very short time period, say a few days or weeks. But over years, that probably isn't going to be very accurate. We also have a completely homogeneous population, so everyone is exactly the same, spreading the disease at the same rate, and recovering from it at the same rate too. And finally, our beta and gamma are constant, so the rates of infection and recovery aren't changing. However, in the real world, things like social distancing or more effective treatments might cause those to change over time. And these aren't all the assumptions we've made, there's lots more. These are just a few examples of some of the big ones. Getting back to the equations, before we can start playing around with the model and running some simulations, let's just think about what happens right at the beginning of an outbreak, when pretty much the whole population is susceptible. So that means that S is very close to N, and we can approximate di by dt as beta minus gamma times i. And since beta and gamma are both positive, if beta is larger than gamma, then i will grow exponentially. On the other hand, if beta is smaller than gamma, then the number of infected will decrease and the outbreak dies out before it even gets started. Or we can think about the ratio beta over gamma, which is often called r0. And then our conditions become r0 must be greater than 1 for the disease to grow, and it will die out if r0 is less than 1. Now, we want to get a feel for how this model behaves, so let's take a look at some graphs showing how the system evolves for different values of R0. And in each graph, we can see the number of infected grows initially, reaches a peak, and then tails off to zero. But the higher the value of R0, the higher that peak is, and the faster it arrives. Also, in the top two graphs, you can see quite clearly that a large chunk of the population is still susceptible after the epidemic has come and gone, which isn't the case on the lower graphs. 
so that gives us a couple of variables we can try to analyze. The peak number of infected individuals and the fraction of the population that's susceptible at the end, so the people who never caught the disease. So let's start with the infected peak. Now, we can't do much with these equations as they are, but what can we do to try and solve them? Well, the right-hand sides are very similar, so we want to combine them in such a way that some things cancel out. And we could add them, but that doesn't really get us anywhere. Instead, if we divide one equation by the other, then the right-hand sides will simplify, and the dt's on the left will cancel out as well. So let's go ahead and do that, and then we can simplify this slightly, and we get a differential equation where the right-hand side is only a function of s. So this is actually a separable differential equation where we'll be able to integrate both sides separately to solve it. So we can bring the ds over to the right, integrate both sides, and then we need to find the constant of integration. And for that we need to use a boundary condition, and we know that at the beginning, a long time before the epidemic begins, i is zero, or if not then it's very close to zero, and s equals n. So we can plug that in, work out what it gives us, and now we've got an equation for i in terms of s. But how can we use this to work out the peak number of infected? Well, normally, if you wanted to do that, you'd find out when di by dt is equal to zero, but we can't do that here. However, we already know what di by ds is, and if you think about when that is zero, it's when s is changing, but i isn't. So it tells us the exact same thing as if we had di by dt equals zero. Then we can use this to get the value of s when i is at its maximum, and plug that in. And we get this function of r naught, so let's see what it looks like. Well, it's zero when r naught is one, that makes sense, that's good to see. Then it grows slowly until about one and a quarter, then quicker after that, and then it starts to flatten off beyond about four or five. And this sort of information could be really useful if you want to estimate the likely impact of something like social distancing, say, which will alter the value of r naught. Next, let's look at the other key variable we mentioned, the number of uninfected or survivors, people who never catch the disease. Which of the two measures is more useful probably depends on the nature of the disease and its mortality rate. If it's something quite treatable with a low mortality like COVID, then we're probably more interested in the peak number of infected. If it's something more deadly though, then the number of survivors is what we really care about. So how can we find this as a function of r naught? Well, it's the value of s after the epidemic has passed, so i equals zero. But this is an awkward function of s, we can't just write the answer down. Instead, we'll need to use something like the bisection method to find the solution for a range of values of r naught. Say this red line is our function, and we want to find the place where it crosses the x-axis. Then we can start with two guesses, one either side of the true value, and take the average of them. Then by looking at the sign of the function here, we know which side we need to look, and we can ignore the other one. And we can keep repeating this process until we converge to the true value. So doing that for lots of values of r naught gives us this graph. And that's pretty interesting in itself, but the great thing about this model is just how flexible it is. You can add new states and different ways of moving between them, and vary the parameters over time, and then see the effects of those changes.
So here is the basic SIR model we've been using up until now. But I'm going to relabel the removed category as immune for reasons that will become clear in just a moment. So what changes could we make to make our model more realistic? Well, we could add an exposed category for people who have caught the disease and will become ill, but aren't contagious yet. So people will move from susceptible to exposed and then to infected. And we can include vaccination. So some people will jump straight from susceptible to recovered. But maybe immunity doesn't last forever if it's something like the flu or common cold. So people can also move back the other way. And lastly, we could add births and deaths so that our population is gradually recycling itself as well. Now our model is a lot more complicated, so we won't be able to do much with it on paper, but it's much more realistic if we want to run some simulations with it. And here's just one example of how the system can behave with all these changes made. As you can see, we get really interesting behaviour where there are multiple peaks in the number of infected and the size of a particular outbreak depends on what fraction of the population is immune at that time. But it's difficult to properly analyse the results when you make about 10 changes at once. So let's take a detailed look at the impact of making just one change, say adding vaccination to our model. Now if we want to incorporate vaccination, that's not too hard. We just want to add a term that moves people from S to R. And say we had a constant delta times S, would that make sense? Well, sort of, because you need susceptible people to vaccinate. And this term will tend to zero as S approaches zero and you run out of people to vaccinate. However, it also means that you're vaccinating randomly without knowing whether the person you're vaccinating is actually susceptible or not, which is probably a bit pessimistic. If we just had a constant term though, so just delta instead of delta times s, then s could become negative, which obviously isn't what we want. So it's not perfect, but we'll stick with it for now. Then similarly to before, we can vary delta the rate of vaccinating people, and measure whatever variable we're interested in, and plot the two against each other. So I chose to look at the peak number of infected, and this is what that graph looks like when r0 equals 4. And you could probably have guessed what shape this graph would be. If you vaccinate just a few people, it makes a big difference. But as we increase delta, we get diminishing returns, which makes sense. But if you're trying to decide whether it's worth vaccinating more people, or whether your time and money is better spent fighting an epidemic some other way, then modelling like this can be really useful. Finally, I thought I'd leave you with a few suggestions of other areas you could look at if you're interested, or maybe just want to practice your coding and see if you can get some simulations to work. You could look at introducing vaccination at various time points, ranging from way before the peak until way after it. You could vary how long immunity to the disease lasts by changing the rate at which people move from category R back to S. Or you could decrease the value of beta at different points to estimate the effect of introducing measures like social distancing. Or you could make the population heterogeneous, so different people spread the disease at different rates recover at different speeds, that sort of thing. And these are just a few examples. There are way more ideas that you might choose to look at. I hope you found this video helpful and interesting. If you did, please drop a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.